It's great to be here again. Um, it was a little over a year ago when I got a call from Saul um, asking me if I would come and speak at Biff. And I had heard of Biff by reputation, and uh, he said, we want you to tell a story, and a personal story. And every fiber in my body screamed out, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Stories are not my thing. I am a person of reason and analysis. I'm totally comfortable in that world. I am very uncomfortable in the world of stories. Um, and it's not just uncomfortable, but it's really painful for me because of some childhood traumas I went through. I retreated into the world of analysis and reason as a zone of safety, and stories pulled me out. And so, uh, against all my better judgment, I accepted the offer to come and speak. And uh, it was a, a wonderful experience. It was a, a, another testament to something that's become increasingly uh, prominent in my mind, which is the notion of going out of your comfort zone. That if we don't constantly go out of our comfort zone and challenge ourselves, we'll never grow. And if we don't grow, we stop living. So it's a, a key uh, lesson that I'm learning more and more as, as I go on. Uh, in fact, the, the experience was so catalytic for me that it embarked me on this quest to learn more about stories and to tr try to understand their power, their importance. And as I got into it, I actually found that I was seeing uh, the word story used very loosely to cover very many different kinds of experiences, ac accounts. Um, and it seemed to me that there are some key differences in terms of types of stories. And so with some trepidation today, I wanted to just share with you a couple of distinctions that I think are important in, in terms of where and how stories can have power. And I wanted to illustrate it with three stories that I'll quickly uh, go through. The first story has to do with about 20 years ago, I was at a consulting firm, McKinsey & Company, and this was in the early 90s. I had just discovered the internet. And I thought the internet was this amazingly powerful new technology platform. It was going to change the world. And so I set up a practice within McKinsey called the internet practice. Uh, most of my partners looked at me like I was from outer space. They had no idea what this was all about. Um, and when I went and asked them if I could go speak to their clients about this internet and its implication for their businesses, uh, they smiled and said, no, that's really not a topic that's of interest to them. Um, and so I, I, it forced me to, to adopt a practice which has served me very well in other venues over time, which is rather than try to push the message about the internet out to uh, the clients through through very risk-averse partners who didn't want to upset their client relationships, I decided to write a book about the importance of the internet on business. Uh, and it ended up becoming a business bestseller. It's called Net Gain back in 1997. Uh, and that book had a very interesting effect in, in that it, people read it, they loved it, they started sharing it with their colleagues and their friends. And inevitably, sooner rather than later, the, call, the phone started ringing and clients started calling partners at McKinsey and saying, I need you to come and talk about the internet. <laughs> and the partners would be kind of evasive, try to avoid it, and the, the client would say, no, I know you guys know about the internet. I just read this book. You've got to come and talk to me. And so it was this notion of pulling uh, the partners out to the clients that ended up creating a very large and vibrant practice. By the time I left McKinsey, seven years later, as a $500 million practice and the, large, the most rapidly growing practice at McKinsey. So that's one story. There's another story which, again, talks about my experiences, and it actually goes way back in life. And when I was about six years old, one of my first memories was that the thing I loved to do most was to drag my parents out on weekends to large construction sites. And at six years old, I would clamber up, helped by my father, onto these massive bulldozers and construction cranes and sit in the seat and pretend that I was maneuvering the, the equipment. And um, it was really, really exciting to me. I mean, toys, that was, 
I had no interest in toys. I wanted to be up there in, these, in this equipment. And it wasn't about the equipment per se. It was about the notion of imagining the kinds of buildings that I would be able to build and the kinds of things that people would be able to do in those buildings. And I, I had a whole series of interests over time. And about 20 years ago, discovered the internet and became equally fascinated with the internet, particularly the, the opportunity to construct new kinds of relationships across many different people, across many different geographies. Fascinating potential and opportunity. And as I step back and reflect on that trajectory of interests over time, what I found was that I was really moved by and, and excited about and passionate about the opportunity to, to help bring platforms of potential and possibility into society. And it wasn't about the platforms themselves, it was about how people could use these platforms to realize more of their potential and create more possibility for themselves. So I wasn't so much into the technology per se, although that was interesting. It was really about what people could do with it. And over time, I found that actually what was interesting was while I was trying to help other people figure out how to take advantage of these, uh, these new capabilities and possibilities, I was helping myself. I was a very shy person as a child, and I found that with the internet in particular, I was able to connect with people in online communities in ways that I felt much more comfortable doing than in physical space, face-to-face -face interactions. And I created a marvelous set of relationships that over time spilled over into physical space and created this very large community that I, I draw great, great sustenance from. Now, so that's a second, a second story. There's a third story, just briefly, a, a story about the United States. One of the interesting things about the US is that over its history, it's been a magnet for risk takers. People from all over the world have been drawn, pulled to the United States, left very comfortable, familiar circumstances, and often at great risk to their own lives, made it to this country. Even today, the Mexican immigrant workers who are trying to cross our increasingly militarized borders, risking their lives to get across that border and come into the US. Very exciting notion that we have drawn together a set of people who have that risk-taking mindset, that desire to improve themselves, improve their families, make the world better. And they're explorers. Even if they made it to the US in the early days and they were in these well-established villages and towns on the East Coast, they were heading west, out into the country where nobody had been, constantly wanting to explore. And when they ran out of space to explore, geographic space, they started looking for other areas to explore, outer space, uh, underwater exploration, going within the body, all kinds of exploration that drove the US. And I think what's interesting, if you step back, I've told three stories, but I would argue they're quite different. And I want to make a distinction that's been a bit controversial. I've tried to make it in the past, and I've encountered some pushback and resistance to it. But I think there's a distinction, and maybe I'll need to create a new word for it. But I distinguish between a story and a narrative. And what I mean, the distinction that I want to highlight here, is that for me, stories are contained in a, in a certain space and time. They have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They come to an end. The story that I told about McKinsey and my pull approach to building a practice there, to me, is a story. Beginning, middle, and end. I had a challenge, I overcame it, I became successful in that initiative. That, to me, is quite different from a narrative, which, from my perspective, the distinguishing character of a narrative is it's open-ended. It's continuously unfolding. There is no end. And because there is no end and it's continuously unfolding, it invites participation from others, others to get involved in that narrative and to contribute to it and to help shape how it unfolds. Now, you can think about narrative as a personal narrative 
And I think the second story that I told was more of a personal narrative. It was my trajectory and what excites me and where, what motivates me uh, to contribute. And there's a, an invitation to participate. If you're excited about the kinds of things I'm excited about, it draws you in. You want to talk and you want to share some of your own interests and experiences and maybe contribute to some of my initiatives. But then when you get to the third story, it's a national narrative. It's a narrative that goes beyond many people and invites participation. It says, this is about risk-taking and exploration. How can we work together to, to take it to the next level? And it's continuously unfolding. There is no end to that story. So to me, narratives are really, really powerful in the sense that, in, particularly in times of uncertainty, there's what I call the uncertainty paradox. And that is that in uncertain times, we actually have more degrees of freedom to shape our future than ever before, in rapidly changing uncertain times. And yet it's exactly in uncertain times that we tend to hold back. We tend to focus on the risks and forget about the opportunities. We become risk averse. We become very cautious in terms of our actions, just at the time when there are more degrees of freedom to reshape than ever before. So it's an interesting paradox, and I think narratives in particular are very powerful in terms of providing both focus, helping to point out the opportunity, the direction, and to help motivate people to move in that direction. So very powerful. There's another element in narrative that I think is often misunderstood or overlooked, which is it provides a source of stability. And it's really interesting, in times of high uncertainty, you know, people have different views about change and uncertainty. Some view it as a threat, some view it as an opportunity. But most of us, I think, find it uncomfortable. You know, there's fear in the, in the unknown and what's happening. And in that kind of environment, we all tend to want some stability in our lives. Where is that stability going to come from? I think we've lost in the US at least, a sense of narrative as a potential for stability, a source for stability. If you look at the business world where I come from, we've become more and more short-term focused, which again is a very natural psychological reaction to uncertainty. You just focus on the next day, the next month, the next quarter. Narratives, who's got time for narratives? We may tell some stories, some little stories with a beginning and an end to motivate people, but narratives, no. In the national sphere, we have lost a shared narrative. We have narrative. We have two narratives that I would argue are threat-based narratives. There's the narrative of the right and the Republicans, which is about threat. We've got terrorists outside our borders who are coming at us. We've got to prepare for that threat. And we've got threats internally. We've got people who are trying to undermine our family values and corrupt our children. Another threat we have to defend against. Very threat-based narrative. Very compelling, motivates a lot of people. And I would say equally true on the left and the Democratic side, we have gone to a threat-based narrative. Our jobs are at risk. Our livelihoods, we're getting squeezed every day by these large corporations who are trying to get us out of our jobs. Our benefits are at risk. Medicare, Medicaid, all at risk. Our environment is being destroyed by these short-term profit-making enterprises. We're at risk, there's a threat. We have to mobilize against the threat. I think there's a real opportunity sh to shift the discourse and focus more on opportunity-based narratives, and hopefully find a narrative that can mobilize and energize us and focus us in a direction that's much more productive, and provide a source of stability that will help us to get through very uncertain and increasingly challenging times. Thank you very much.